Good, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Orchun Salchuk. I'm an assistant professor of political science. I'm also co-directing the International Studies uh, program here at Luther. Uh, today, we gathered to discuss the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, just wanted to provide some background about this event. So this is a pop-up event organized by the Center, of, uh, Center for Ethics and Public Engagement, also known as the CEPE, uh, which does this type of events um, once in a while. So when I first came here, for example, two years ago, we did an event on Latin America. Last year, we did a very similar event, which was called Tell Me About Myanmar, which was right after the military coup uh, that happened in, in Myanmar, where three students from Myanmar shared their personal uh, experiences. So again, this event particularly will, will be a similar format where we have three uh, members of uh, Luther community. We have two faculty members and a student uh, from Ukraine uh, who will be sharing their personal uh, reflections, you know, how the current war, how the current Russian invasion uh, has affected, affected them. So again, in that sense, this event is not a political discussion or or historical analysis of you know what caused the war, or it's not a prediction of the war, what's going on. So it's mainly focusing on the personal aspect of the war and how the war uh, has affected uh, our particular members of the community. In this case, you know Marina, Roman, and Sasha, who are uh, valuable members of uh, Luther community. So in terms of the format, I'm first going to pass it to uh, our panelists, our speakers, uh, who our Ukrainian heritage, who either were, was born in Ukraine or in, in, in his case, in Sasha's case, uh, parents born, born in Ukraine. Uh, and then after that, I will open it up for uh, brief uh, questions, uh, which will be the second uh, half of our uh, panel uh, today. But again, in the question and answer period, uh, if you can keep it short, if you can, you know, ask questions to your panelists rather than making statements or making argumentative points, points we would highly uh, appreciate that. Uh, and I will just again pass it to Marina, who who will make uh, brief remarks, and then we can go to Sasha, and then we can finally go to uh, Roman again. Thank you for being here, and then Marina, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, everyone, for being here. For those who do not know me, my name is Marina Basilevich Nading. I was born in Ukraine. I was raised in Ukraine. And I came here in 2000 to attend an undergraduate college in Indianapolis, Indiana, and then later on returned to the U.S. once again uh, to begin my doctoral studies at State University of New York at Albany and eventually moved to Decorah in 2010 to join the anthropology faculty here. And so I've called Decorah my home ever since then. But of course, Ukraine will always be my homeland, the place where I grew up, the place where my all of my family and friends live, um, you know, from the first 20 years of my life, all right? So this obviously is a very personal matter to me. And so my remarks today, I just kind of want to give you a heads up, I guess, will maybe challenge you a little, right, to imagine, um, you know, what would it be like if, you know, it were your homeland or if this current battlefield, you know, were not in Ukraine, but were right here in your own uh, backyard, right? What would it feel like? So uh, forgive me if my comments <laughs> might, um, might be unpleasant, you know, f for some of us to hear, but Obviously, I will be polite and I will maintain, um, yeah, will try to maintain my composure as well. All right, so I'm going to read a few things because I want to make really just three points. Three points, and I want to give credit to the Ukrainian American Crisis Response Committee of Michigan that has put together long ago, back in 2014, with the invasion of Crimea, a very good site with all sorts of resources for um, Americans, Ukrainian Americans, you know, other uh, Americans to, who are interested in that region, you know, who want to understand what's happening, who want to kind of have simple messaging from that part of the world. So I'm, I just want to say that some of these resources that I consulted came from them. All right, so my first point 
is that Ukraine matters because peace matters. And peace should matter to everyone, regardless of their nationality or where they happen to live. I know that the US and Europe want to protect their citizens and want to maintain a certain neutrality in fear of provoking Russia, in fear of its nuclear weapons. Um, with this aggressive authoritar authoritarian neighbor to Ukraine's east, with recurrent threats, now with this full-scale invasion under the pretense of liberation, Ukraine does not have the choice of neutrality. We didn't ask for this war, it just showed up on our doorstep. And because Ukraine is a sovereign nation, it deserves the right of self-determination. In 1994, Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal in exchange for security assurances from the US and from other countries in the Budapest Memorandum. Now Ukraine needs American support. And unfortunately, today it means military support. In particular, we need the US to give serious consideration to establishing a no-fly zone or shelter over Ukrainian skies. This will protect civilians while Ukrainian army is fighting on the ground. Sorry, just lost my spot here. All right, although it may feel scary, what is even scarier, and I think it should be scarier for everyone, is the world if Mr. Putin and the likes of him win. And here I'll quote my friend Enrico Pavignani, who lives in Mozambique, and who says this, his prediction of the world with Putin as a victor. Arms sales will thrive in a world turning more belligerent. The right-wing drive already potent in the rich world will be boosted, and millions of people will lose everything. The survivals will nurture their resentment. So we will not have world peace if Mr. Putin wins, even if Americans and Europeans remain safe. So this matters, peace matters. Second point, Ukrainians just want peace. Russia has invaded Ukraine roughly every century since 1149 AD, and Ukraine has never invaded Russia. So I just want to share a few words that a friend read for me at the Peaceful Communion a few days ago um, to kind of support the second point that I'm trying to make. People in Ukraine are staying encouraged. There are many stories of heroic acts. I'm sure you've seen them all over the internet. Uh, by soldiers, by civilians. Um, but I want to tell you that, you know, it doesn't seem like people have a lot of fear, you know, because they truly don't have a choice. The only choice they have is to flee or stay, right? That's the only choice. And sometimes they don't have that choice either, depending on where, on where they end up. Uh, so they're not afraid, or at least they claim not to be afraid when I call and talk to them. They're not crying, but they are very angry. And they're angry at Russia, but they're also angry at the West for waiting for so long and not intervening earlier and sooner and stronger. Um, American news focuses a lot on humanitarian crisis, and it does matter. People literally have to start their life from point zero uh, in many instances, and it's millions of people. But Ukraine has more than 40 million citizens, and most of them are in Ukraine. They're staying in Ukraine. They want to live in Ukraine. They don't want a life of a refugee. And it is their own home. So the towns are organized. They are fortifying. They are digging up trenches. Um, you know, they have territorial self-defense. Everyone is volunteering. It's like a full-time job, basically, for people at this moment. And they do it happily because what is the option, right? There is no other option. In fact, it's kind of surreal because, you know, when I am upset or even desperate, it's usually, you know, even though I don't try to show it to my friends, but it's usually them who end up consoling me, you know, uh, inadvertently, even though I don't ask for, for that from them, of course. Um, so, Russia's leaders seek to reestablish control over countries that spent centuries resisting colonialism, like Ukraine. Ukraine wishes only for the freedom to perceive its own future, and it poses no threat to Russia. And this is a very important point. And finally, last point is sort of linked to my first point, that this is not just about Ukraine. 
Ukraine just happens to be the battlefield at this moment. In Mr. Putin's head, this war is with the West. He has demonstrated that treaties and agreements do not matter to him. His word doesn't mean anything. The humanitarian corridors that they agree upon every day are being shelled. Um, it's peaceful citizens who are trying to evacuate. Um, I can talk more about humanitarian corridors if you are interested later. But this aggression against Ukraine that's been ongoing is a violation of the Helsinki Final Act, the Budapest Memorandum, the UN Charter, the Minsk Agreements, and all of these documents Russia signed. So there is no guarantee of peace unless he is no longer in power. Um, putting advanced reasons to invade. And um, furthermore, he has perfected the new forms of warfare. So this is this uncomfortable point that I want to make. Geographic distance is not going to promise you peace. There is nuclear terrorism, there is bioterrorism, there is cyber war, meddling in democratic elections of independent nations. He has probably many more um, things that he can come up with um, and his team. So truly the only way to be assured of peace is to stop Putin in every way that the world can, and right now. Um, to conclude, I just want to read words of uh, Sophia. She is a daughter of my teacher. Um, she is 13. She is very angry. Um, she is right now in Poland and um, is safe, you know, um, doesn't want to be in Poland, wants to go back to Ukraine, but she wants to tell us this. So just a few words and I'll be done. She says, we all study history in school, but unfortunately it seems to me people learn nothing. Um, I've read people's regrets about genocides, wars, mass killings. Isn't today the same? It's a crime against civilization. And I'm shocked that you cannot stop it. A few years of our lives have been ruined by COVID. Now half of my country has been destroyed. My classmates are in shelters, um, dreaming about going to school. So we don't care about money, oil prices, exchange rates, but we care about future, freedom, education, and environment. What do you care about? Thank you. Thank you, Marina, for your powerful words. Now I will pass it to Sasha. Uh, well, hi, I'm Sasha. Um, I'm a, a sophomore here. I'm a vocal performance and math double major. Um, I'm on the swim team, and I'm in cathedral choir. Very busy here, um, but I also have a life in Ukraine. Um, I was born in Minnesota, yes, but I actually learned Russian first. It was my first language, and I only learned English when I was five when I went to preschool. Um, so, yeah, but anyways, um, my parents were born in Lviv, uh, Ukraine, and immigrated to Minnesota in the 90s. Uh, they left shortly after Ukraine gained their independence as a free state, knowing their, in their guts that they were still far from safe there. Uh, my grandparents followed afterwards, um, mainly to raise me and my brother, but also to escape the country. Um, the family I have left in Ukraine is split between Kiev, where my father's side now lives, and uh, Lviv, where my mother's side lives. Um, as of right now, the women and children of my Kiev family are safe and in hiding in a rural town across the country. They traveled hours and hours to get there, and the men are fighting since um, men have been called to arms in K Ukraine. Um, the first building bombed in Kiev actually happens to be on the same block as their apartment, So, uh, but luckily they were able to get out of town before any of this, so they never witnessed any of the bombings. Um, my Lviv family is staying in their apartment and will move to the basement if or realistically when necessary. Um, Lviv currently has 200,000 refugees from across Eastern Europe attempting to make it to Poland and other countries on the western border. Uh, fun fact, uh, Ukraine has a longer history than Russia. Kiev has been the capital since the 9th century and architecture from a thousand years ago is now being destroyed. I'm heartbroken with the events of Ukraine and 
Um, I've been there multiple times. I most recently in 2019 and uh, hearing from family and reading news updates about destroyed landmarks and um, other places that I have visited is it's devastating. Um, museums containing world famous art have been bombed while other buildings are preparing for further shelling. Um, even today earlier I read a, um, a news article about a school that was bombed and a bunch of children just are gone now. So. Um, there are seven UNESCO heritage sites in Ukraine deemed the seven wonders of Ukraine and who knows how many there will be after all of this. Um, everyone talks about the two million Ukrainians who have fled the country, but nobody talks about the 140,000 Ukrainians that have come back to fight. Athletes who are mid-season, performers of classical dance and opera who have come back from tours and residencies, even ordinary people who haven't been there in years or decades are back to defend their country. This is a rebirth of our nation. This is not a fight for nationalism, it's a fight for national identity. Um, people of all ethnicities and languages live in Ukraine. Call it a melting pot, if you will. I remember from my visit there, people who spoke Russian, Ukrainian, Romanian, Polish, everything. There are churches, monasteries, temples. There's lots of diversity, Catholics, Orthodox, Jews, Muslims, all of the above. <clears throat> Russia is brainwashing its citizens at the moment. The internet's cut out, there's no access to international news sources, and people are being arrested for protesting. Even mentioning no war or negative comments about the invasion can put you in a jail cell. There are currently 14,000 people in Russia who've been arrested for these protests. Um, even more astounding, my own grandparents happen to have only Russian programming, the ones who live in Minnesota. Um, their views are skewed towards Russia based solely off the fact that this is their only news source. Their English is far from good enough to be able to understand any news outlets in the United States, and um, they're not the most tech savvy, so they're stuck with Russia's Первый канал, or Channel One. Um, so what to do? Um, the only real way to help those in Ukraine is, I mean, financially, I guess. Uh, you can donate to major organizations, smaller organizations. You can rent out Airbnbs. I mean, obviously not go there, but um, you can find people with family there and ask to donate to them. You can also help protest companies who continue to sell products in Russia, like Coca-Cola, Nestle, Nestle and Danon, to name a few. Um, McDonald's was on the list until this morning. So, um, And lastly, be vocal, post, share, like, comment, spread, in, spread correct information from reliable sources and shut down misinformation. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Roman. Thanks. I don't have prepared notes because uh, uh, I just don't have time. Uh, <laughs> it's that simple between the... Uh, the work and just scrolling the news and news feed and checking all of that uh, first thing in the morning, last thing before you go to bed, in the bed, that's all you do. And uh, I just want you to, I, I want to thank you all for coming here, for uh, learning about Ukraine. And I hope you will leave this meeting with more information about the country and people of the country. And hopefully you'll understand that it's not a war that is in its 13th day or 12th. It's a blur. Uh, it's a war that has been going on for years and centuries. It's not a war of one man with a twisted sense of history. It's a war of one country against culture of Ukraine that has been going on for decades and centuries. It's not... It's not new. The, the goal is the same. It's extermination of Ukrainians and Ukrainian culture. It's just a new method, a new, new page in this, this water. So I just want you to think about that and want you to think about people in Ukraine who have no choice. Kids, elderly, people who cannot leave anymore they're being bombed out of existence. And I just want you to think about the methods that of the war. It's not a 
noble war. It's not a war of army versus army in open field. It's a war of well-trained army against civilians to turn civilians against the government of Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, all, all three speakers. We do have around 30, 35 minutes. Um, we can open it up for, for questions and maybe some brief, uh, you know, supportive uh, comments. Uh, but if you are going to ask a question, please keep it brief. And also, please first introduce yourself. Uh, we do have faculty, staff, students, but also we do have community members from the CORA. Uh, so before, again, your remarks, before your question, if you can introduce yourself, uh, that would be great. We also do have a live stream, so that's why I would uh, hand the microphone to you uh, so people can uh, also hear you uh, online. So does anybody have any questions? Yes. Part of my understanding of this situation is that before the invasion actually ensued, and for many years, actually since 2008, uh, Putin has been asking that the NATO forces not come into that area, that there be no further expansion. And what do you think, uh, and apparently that up to the up to the present uh, was part of the problem from him that it was an existential threat to Russia, he thought, for weapons to be on that soil. So my question to you is, could it be a peace, uh, a, a, a form of peace to say, okay, we won't have NATO here. We will just be our country alone and leave us alone, you know, from both sides. That's just my question. Ju oh, sorry, Julie Fisher from Decora. Do, do you want to answer, Roman? Yeah, sure. Uh, Ukraine, unfortunately, is not part of NATO. Uh, the country missed that chance in the 90s uh, because it was decided that it's better for Ukraine to be neutral, not to join NATO, to actually join the, this Commonwealth of Independent States, to have ties with Russia to uh, not to uh, provoke, have good, be in good grace of Russia. Uh, Ukraine had that in their constitution, that they're not going to join NATO, they're not going to join any, uh, any bloc, they're just neutral country, absolutely neutral, gave up nukes, well, they were not very good anyways. Um, uh, and that was the idea. In the 90s, in 2000s, uh, there was no push for NATO in Ukraine because there was no threat. People in Ukraine did not think, unfortunately, of course, uh, now they know that, uh, uh, that they would have to have any kind of protection from Russia. There was no push to join NATO. There was no push to uh, to be any part of that bloc. Yes, of course, Ukrainian forces and army conducted joint operations with NATO. Yeah, just like Russia. <laughs> they had the joint uh, maneuvers just fine. Yeah, Ukraine uh, would send soldiers to Afghanistan and Iraq to support uh, peacekeeping missions and to support, uh, you know, UN Blue Berets and Blue uh, Forces or so peacekeeping forces. Yeah, just like uh, uh, with NATO, Ukraine would uh, collaborate with Russia. So it wasn't in any way, shape or form uh, a move in Ukraine to join NATO when the in 2014 when Russia invaded Ukraine and occupied part of territory Crimea and uh, eastern part of Ukraine Donbas 
Ukraine was by constitution neutral country. It was not going, not planning to join NATO. So I, I don't think that's part of the uh, equation at all, because if you read the uh, uh, I know requirements or the demands of Russians now, it's to uh, establish bilingual or give some kind of rights to Russian language in Ukraine, it was always the case, uh, give more rights to Russian church in Ukraine and pretty much dismantle Ukrainian church. Uh, and of course, write it in the constitution not to join NATO, which of course is uh, not how the world works. One country, however big, cannot demand that other country joins or doesn't join any uh, anything. That's pretty much not, not, not how the work should work, uh, how the world should work. And if you remember in 2013, the big uprising in Ukraine started because the former president decided not to join the European Union. It's not even NATO, it's not a military bloc, it's an economic bloc. He decided not to join as some kind of low level associate member of EU. Well, because at the last moment, he was pressured by Russia not to do that because they were afraid that Ukraine would suddenly become a bit more democratic, a bit more prosperous, a bit further to the values of the free world as opposed to the values of Russia, whatever they are. Does anybody want to add anything? Okay, we can get more questions. Maybe we can get a couple of questions and then I can group them and we can answer them together. Salome. Hi, everyone. Um, Orchun asked me to stand up, but um, I'm a student. Um, I am studying currently comparative politics um, with Professor Selchuk, and we are seeing um, how these very populist authoritarian leaders are trying to take control over not even their own country, but as we see in this case, other nations around. So I don't know, just my question is why has no one stopped him yet? Like why are not even Russians trying to stop him yet or or even other, I don't know, international organizations as United Nations haven't had the power to stop someone like Putin and take it all this way to, to having a war. And maybe from an anthropological perspective, um, what do you think that are some of the mechanisms that uh, Ukrainians are using to co-op with this sense of war and tragedy? And I don't know, from your perspective, what has been the most successful act of solidarity among Russians? I'm sorry, you're carrying this. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Jora. I'm double major in Econ and Data Science. And um, we, uh, my country is also recently independent in 2002. And my own family have been through war. So I can't say I understand you directly, but I've been in similar positions. Um, my question is kind of related to um, the sanctions imposed to Russia. How do you think that sanctions that countries are imposing towards Russia, whether it would be effective or not, and how do you think that would support, like, um, stop Putin's action in terms of like invading in Ukrainian invasion? Thank you. We can take a third. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Fred Bryant. Um, where to start? Um, Putin has uh, said that he wants to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. Uh, he also wants to stop the cultural genocide that has occurred in Ukraine since 2014 and the rise of groups like Azov, C-14, 
uh, the right uh, uh, and uh, so when we had I remember when we saw the the truckers uh, rebelling in Canada and I had friends tell me that they would see somebody with a Nazi flag and they said well, yeah, those, if those truckers really weren't Nazis they'd go out there and rip that flag away from that person well, where were all the Ukrainian-speaking Ukrainians uh, when people were marching with uh, uh, Nazi symbolism? Uh, and uh, and I was watching an assembly uh, in which people had badges on with the letters 88 and C14. Do we know what 88 refers to? And 14, 14, 1 and 4 in Ukrainian alphabet is letters A and H. Who does that stand for? And 88, that's a, that's a, that's a right-wing symbol, symbolism uh, that's used worldwide. That's HH. And what does that stand for? So anyway, yeah. HH, well, H. Howl Hitler. And the AH is Adolf Hitler. Again, I would like to urge uh, that we're not here to actually, you know, dispute people's personal experiences. Again, this is not a avenue to discuss, you know, potential Nazism or, you know, other other topics. If you could, again, ask uh, questions rather than making statements, uh, I would really appreciate that for, for our panelists. Because, again, the format of this talk is tell me about Ukraine and I'm from Turkey. And even though I'm a political scientist, it's not my position to talk about Ukraine when we have three Ukrainians here. So I would also, you know, encourage um, our audience not to, you know, blatantly uh, going against uh, going against them. But again, if you guys want to uh, answer any of the questions or briefly comment on a statement, uh, please go ahead. I can talk. I can talk about anthropology. So, <laughs> uh, it was Salome's question: Why has no one stopped Putin? What are Russians doing? I um, and also kind of how are people coping? So, in the conditions that they are in, no one expected the war. If people knew that they'll that this is what the war will look like, they would at least move away from those border provinces of Ukraine towards areas that have less uh, danger. Because Russia is a broader nation, right? Someone's been, you know, there are so many amazing jokes uh, all over internet that, that I think is one way Ukrainians are coping is humor. That where they said something like, thank God we only have two brother nations, Belarus and Russia. You know, we don't need more <laughs> brothers. So the point there is that, you know, we do have a lot of history with Russia. And most Ukrainians of my generation, probably even younger ones, can are bilingual. So we can speak the same language, you know. And um, you probably have also seen it all over the Internet where people will literally just talk to soldiers, you know, approach them, talk to them. What are you doing here? Do you know where you are? You know, some of them initially didn't even know where they were, you know, which demonstrates just how much um, misinformation and how much um, brainwashing is happening inside of Russia. Um, and, you know, when they knew where they were, they would tell them, like, don't, we don't need you. <laughs> don't need to be liberated from anyone. We're fine. Leave us alone. Go home. Can I help you? Can I give you a ride back home to Russia? I can do that, right? So people are coping with that, you know. Um, unfortunately, all of that kind of initial hype or feeling like, oh, thank God they haven't just conquered us in two days, that has kind of gone away, you know. And now when you are reading news, it's a lot more somber, a lot more grim. You know, we know that civilians are being attacked every day um, in an effort to terrorize people, to try to put pressure on the Ukrainian government to give up, basically. 
But the reason the Ukrainian government is not giving up is that truly we don't have an alternative because the kinds of things that Putin has in store for Ukrainians they don't need to imagine that because we have gone through it just recently during Soviet Union. So everyone's grandma, everyone's grandpa can easily tell all these terrible things about persecution that any ethnic minority has experienced in Soviet Union. But Ukrainians definitely saw with the famine of the 1930s, which was man-made to try to subdue the country. This is just a little, you know, different weapons, but same story, just as Roman has pointed out. So um, I don't think it's an option for Ukrainians. You know, the terms that Russia has put forward for us is capitulation, denazification, what else? Like some terms that, you know, like we don't know how to comply with those terms because they are fables, they're invented, you know, and, it's unfortunate that some people believe in that, but it's been a systematic effort to uh, use information as a weapon um, and twist stories. There are lots of um, very reputable sources that demonstrate the kind of fake news that unfortunately um, Putin media is perpetrating, is spreading around, and there is a lot of effort to rebuke that. Um, and actually that's one of the forms of volunteering is to is tracing those things and providing evidence to the contrary. So yeah, um, another way in which Ukrainians are coping really briefly, and then I'll wanna give Sasha and Roma a chance to say something too, is by uniting, you know, and that is definitely the case. Um, my hometown, because it hasn't been touched directly i mean they the first day of war the airport was bombed right away you know because the russians were trying to destroy the infrastructure they still are uh and some military arsenal kind of areas but um you know peaceful citizens haven't been under that kind of a direct a attack yet and hopefully that will stay that way um, but because of that, it has become a hub also of volunteering, just like Lviv. Um, and actually, fun fact, you know, it's Khmelnytsky that borders Ternopil, where Roman is from, and then it's Lviv. So we are kind of, you know, neighbors <laughs> in the central western Ukraine. Yeah, Ukraine is closest to Kiev, closer to Kiev than Ternopil or, or Lviv. Um, so, yeah, basically there are these areas that they call headquarters and different um, activists in town have immediately kind of started organizing. So the, our biggest movie theater is one of them, our city administration area, the like sports complex of our biggest university in town are those hubs, right? And there are sort of leaders, you know, just like charismatic leaders who have emerged from this situation who then try to coordinate, right? And I am impressed with coordination. There are so many volunteers, you know, everything is closed. Schools are closed. Um, essential industries are working, but that's it. So people have time um, and a lot of, you know, nervous anxiety and energy to do something. So every day they wake up and go there just like they would go to work. And, you know, they are making these nets to camouflage tanks and, soldiers, you know, they are coordinating food deliveries, you know, for those who are just passing through the town, staying one night or two nights, they are bringing literally warm meals to the train station. And when the evacuation train is going through my town, those people have an opportunity to leave the train for just a few minutes, eat a warm meal and keep going. Uh, volunteers also are driving, you know, their personal vehicles, they have paperwork, that allows them to cross checkpoints and they go all the way to the front line and uh, to give bring food to bring medications you know people are out of insulin you know who are diabetic i mean there are all these humanitarian issues happening and um unfortunately i mean they have to put themselves in danger to do it but i really do think that they you know they they just do it because what so what, what's the option sit at home and wait till it comes all the way you know, to, to our hometown, obviously that's not very prudent or tolerable course of action either. So 
um, yeah, I'm very thankful. Lots of people have supported my call for helping me send money and yeah, the, you know, we are sending that money every day just directly to those people who are able, who are in a position to be very flexible and immediately uh, spend it where it needs to be. Yeah. Um, just a brief comment on coping as well. I know my my family in Lviv is, I mean, they're just kind of living normal life almost right now, ki kind of, like kind of. Um, my aunt is a school teacher and she's basically just teaching online. I mean, we're all familiar with like Zoom school, so it's basically the same thing there right now. Um, unfortunately, it's not the other, the, not the same on the East turn side. I mean, yeah, you you mentioned that they're just making memes, joking about it, but at the same time, it's it's all real, it's all there, so. Roma? I think the, the question was about sanctions and uh, kind of w why people in Russia are not doing anything. Uh, there is this fight in Russia between TV and the fridge. And whoever controls TV used to win because, well, fridge is kind of half empty, half full, so well, it's okay. Uh, and sanctions are supposed to make that fridge empty. And then empty fridge wins over TV. 10 times of 10. Uh, and so that's kind of the idea. And uh, going back to sanctions, it's just to me unprecedented how fast and how vast they are over the last two weeks. Uh, we are seeing now like Coke and Pepsi and McDonald's and companies leaving Russia and because it's toxic. And I don't know if you see the, if you follow the uh, dollar or two. Uh, ruble uh, exchange rate, it's just plummeting. And uh, that hopefully will force people to seek other uh, sources of information except you know, in addition to the first channel and whatever they, else they have because that's just reality, right? You cannot feed 100 million people with lies from TV. It's just impossible. So... I guess, I again, I want to thank you all. I want to thank you for not complaining about $4 gas uh, at a gas station because that's, that's what we are paying for, for the values, right? You, you, if I have to pay $5, $10 uh, at a gas station, I'm fine with that because the alternative is worse. The alternative is... Uh, Russian values, which is not much. <laughs> Just to um, add what you, um, I would say, both of you said about misinformation and disinformation uh, campaign. Uh, so when the COVID-19 pandemic started, there was also this talk that we're also living through the misinformation, disinformation pandemic, right? And, you know, with the COVID-19, there's vaccinations, there's masks. Uh, but with the misinformation, disinformation, there isn't much. And Sasha, you said, you know, your grandparents, right, that the 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 most accessible, you know, media source to them is in Russian, and Russian media sources tend to be, you know, pro-Putin. And, and so my question to you, and this is mainly to help our audience to further, you know, inform themselves, what are some media outlets in English um, that that you would recommend uh, people here or watching us uh, online to to watch, read, and also what are some outlets to avoid? Um, so I, because I think these are both uh, important. Uh, oftentimes, I think you know this information literacy is uh, is also part of the problem, right? Roman earlier talked about you know scrolling through you know social media, scrolling through you know. Uh, these, you know, websites, Facebook, uh, but, you know, we also know from this country, right, oftentimes what appears on your Facebook newsfeed, what appears on your Twitter newsfeed uh, may not be accurate. So um, apart from, again, the Russian or Ukrainian, you know, uh, outlets, what are some news outlets, journalists uh, that you would consider credible uh, so that people uh, here can, you know, follow Ukraine? Um, more in a more accurate way and avoiding the Russian uh, very effective, I would say, strategic 
uh, disinformation campaign, not only targeting Russian citizens, but I would say targeting, you know, uh, American citizens, targeting Europeans, targeting, you know, I'm from Turkey also, again, in Turkey, there is a Sputnik, right, the Russian, uh, you know, news agency, a lot of people, you know, believe that, and, and that's, and people don't know that it's part of, you know, the Russian government, so uh, just curious about your um, thoughts on that. Yeah, I can just briefly say, well, I, I do have to say I read the New York Times because all of you Luther community have access to free subscription. So it's nice because the Washington Post is also nice, but it's not free, right? Or it's free for two weeks or something. I like the Atlantic, of course, from Ukrainian sources. I read the Kiev, oh, let's see here, Kiev Independent, I think it's called in English and it's online. You can read that. There are new voices from Ukraine or of Ukraine. The new voice of Ukraine, that's also a internet-based um, source where you can kind of easily look, um, tune in. I, I printed not so many, maybe 30 copies of things, kind of action items, you know, because so many people have asked and it's been created by someone else, by Martha Kuchar, who works in a different college in Virginia, but, you know, these things are... I modified them a bit and, you know, I'm allowed to share them. Um, but there are many bloggers, right? Like, so I am not on Twitter, so I don't do that kind of stuff. But I have names that I included here of a reputable kind of Ukraine-based journalists who work through social media as opposed to, you know, publishing in a main venue. So you can certainly just track them. I don't know what you guys read. <laughs> What's your preference and what do you, for sources? What, and what do you not read on purpose? I, I don't know what I don't read, I guess, <laughs> right? I'm not sure. Yeah, sorry. I don't I don't really know. I mean, I know someone shared, not someone. Um, my academic advisor shared with me um, a, a, a cartoon, just an a animated short video that's circulated on Pierre Canal and in Russia and elsewhere where they're attempting to explain the war to kids, you know, and if you see that, it's just really, really ugly, you know. It's, um, once again, it's promoting that narrative that, you know, Russia has always been a stronger, better brother and pre protected Ukraine, but Ukraine wanted to be now friends with the U.S. and now it has a weapon and this little boy is holding a stick and you know they're just kind of showing how russia is sorry how ukraine is supposedly now oppressing russians it's not true and then you know how then russia must take the stick away so if you any of you are my facebook friends i'm not sure you know how many of you are you can kind of see that cartoon but i I really, you know, my father likes sending me these outlandish things that are on Russian media just to show me, you know, like as if I don't know already, but but I don't usually post them. I don't want to give voice to that. You know, I don't want it on my page um, because who knows how people will interpret it, you know, and I'm not interested in promoting that kind of ugly messaging. I am on Twitter. Well, I, I read, so uh, my bubble is a bit different, but it's about it, it's a bubble. Uh, but what I would recommend is that you find someone who is stationed in Ukraine, whether Kiev or Lviv now, uh, not someone who writes about Ukraine from Moscow, because that's a, a bit of a twisted uh, view. Um, and there are many outlets, there are many people, there are many journalists who uh, work with, work either independently from Ukraine or work as some kind of freelancers with uh, big cable uh, networks in the States, or you can find some uh, English uh, language outlets in Ukraine, like Cave Independent, or uh, just Google Translate something. Uh, it works in a way. Uh, but I guess my biggest recommendation is that you find uh, sources that uh, are on the ground in Ukraine and report from those cities, not just someone telling the secondhand stories from the office in Moscow. That's uh, That would be my recommendation. And I, the usual thing, um, you 
probably should include Sputnik in your sources, as, as uh, outrageous as it sounds, because you need to know what the other side, what the enemy is posting, and you need to be able to, uh, you know, to, to maybe somehow respond, no, not respond, not share, not uh, give voice to those, but understand what they feed to the uh, constituents inside. And of course, nowadays, it's a bit easier than with the disinformation water uncovered because now you cannot say water inside Russia. You cannot say anything about body bags coming back to Russia because they're not. They don't want to take their bodies back. And uh, so it's much easier for Ukraine to win that information war because there are so many uh, news about uh, all the tanks and uh, uh, choppers and everything that Ukrainian army hits. We don't really see how many uh, losses Ukraine sustain and uh, so it creates this kind of rosy, nice picture of, oh, Ukraine is winning, but in fact, it's, it's gruesome war that may not end well for Ukraine. And it's unlikely, however, the, the heroism and bravery of Ukrainian soldiers and people and everyone there, it's still unlikely to end well for Ukraine one way or the other. It's going to be a country in ruins for many years. Uh, so... I just want you to understand that it's not a war that will end next week. It's uh, uh, And you need to find sources that give you this picture, not just some, oh, uh, it's all well and it's all going to end well. Uh, find some sources that give you a bit more realistic uh, news. Sasha? Yeah. Um... I, my, my cousins in Ukraine have sent me like local news channels, like the links to their main pages. That's mainly what I've been sticking to alongside like the New York times and like kind of CNN and like, you know, some th like more popular things here in America. Um, I just want to send out a word of caution. Like if you're going to be browsing the internet, like, um, so we, we use like .com, .net, .org, yada, yada, yada. Um, and, um, in Russia they use .ru. And in Ukraine, they use .ua at the end of whatever the, the website is. Just um, pay attention to that when you're reading news and articles, sources like that, because it's different. <laughs> Thank you. We can get maybe one more. Amy Walden. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here, um, and thanks to the three of you for for providing your your testimony. Um, having heard you all speak very movingly and well about some very important words here: um, memory, history, myth, truth, um, lies. I'm I'm wondering if you have any reflections you would like to share on how you are seeing yourselves as teachers and as a student here now. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, let's go ahead. Um, well, I, I wanted to be very transparent with my students. I see some of you here. I think I kind of immediately said that, you know, we need to talk about the elephant in the room that I am Ukrainian, you know, they all know I'm Ukrainian. Um, and you know that it's it's different for me <laughs> you know the world sort of has changed its colors you know in one day and it's not even the worst situation for me personally um, and i'm gonna knock on the wood but yeah like uh, uh, it's very clear what is right and what is wrong in my head right now it's not very difficult <laughs> to kind of think about the values what matters what totally doesn't matter you know, no one worries about shoes or purses or makeup techniques or anything like that anymore. Like all of Ukraine just right now cares about this, you know, and wants it to end as soon as is possible with the help of the world community. And I'm sure Russian people, many Russian people want it to end as well. Even the ones who believe the lies of, of Putin, you know, aren't also happy with you know their own kids 
dying there in Ukraine. You know, I'm also very worried about the celebration of militarism and just kind of the security agenda becoming predominant and prevalent across the world. You know, it's not something that personally resonates with me a lot, but, you know, once again, Ukraine has no choice but to fight. And in order to fight, especially when you're outnumbered um, in terms of weapons and soldiers, you know, you have to be brave, right? You have to kind of um, nurture this sort of, you know, strength and courage, you know, and that's what people do, what they have to do, basically, you know, and hopefully... Um, when it's over, you know, people can return to being more peaceful, you know. Yes, celebration of kind of aggra aggressive, you know, military sort of ethos is worrisome to me, but it has to happen, you know, in order for them to stand. Otherwise, there is, you know, what, what else? What's the choice, right? So I definitely support, um, you know, whatever efforts are, you know, I think we can't really judge whatever people do there to survive because we haven't been in their shoes. Thank you. Sasha? Um, I, I will be honest. I used to just, before all of this conflict, I used to just announce myself as Russian um, just because no one knew where Ukraine was, what Ukraine was, who is that, who's Ukraine. Um, but now that, you know, this is happening. People know that it's like Ukraine versus Russia. It's I'm I'm you know proud to say I'm a Ukrainian, and people will now know that. So like no know, know what are you what Ukraine is, who a Ukrainian would be, you know. So um, and I'm definitely like learning more to embrace that culture. I'm I'm wearing a cultural garb. Um, this is a vishivanka. Um, it's a traditional Ukrainian Belarusian clothing. It's um kind of like a like a kilt from the, the UK or um, moccasins from the Native Americans. It's just a sign of safety and unity and yeah, I just, um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Roma? I guess my approach was the opposite of Marina's because I didn't tell my students and uh, I didn't know. A couple of them approached me and offered the words of uh, help and condolences. Uh, but I don't know how many of them know that I'm from Ukraine. Maybe some of them think I'm from Russia and they just don't want to talk to me about that. So uh, uh, that's OK. Uh, and I guess that's how I cope with that. I do. I try to do my work and then I. Uh, go back to my doom scrolling. Thank you so much for, first of all, agreeing to be part of this panel. I know this is a very personal uh, topic uh, for all, all three of you. And thank you again for uh, coming here. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, faculty, staff, students, also Luther, uh, Luther community, the Cora community coming here. Uh, Marina has some call for action items, right? So if anybody is interested in in those, um, please, please approach us uh, after the panel. Um, and good evening, and and have a have a good evening and good night. Thank you.